Did you know that the universe has a speed limit? And no matter how long or how hard anyone has tried, no one has ever passed it? Not cars, not people, not sound or information, not even rocket ships. This speed limit happens to be 186,000 miles per second, the speed of light, C. This limit is incredibly fast, like 7.5 times around the Earth in one second fast. Still, you might think it's odd that the universe has a set speed limit, and perhaps you might think that you're clever enough to beat it. Well, let's first take a closer look at where this limit comes from. So what is speed, or velocity, anyway? Well, speed is defined as the ratio of an object's change in space over the change in time. We all have a good sense of what space is, and we often use Cartesian coordinates to describe it, although you will see later in this video that there is much more to it. But what is time? Well, we can think of time as the potential for change. Whenever we are measuring the speed of an object, we are actually measuring its change in space with respect to the change of something else. That something else can be the rotation of the Earth around the Sun, or the changing hand on a clock. And we use these other standard observations to define and quantify the passage of time. So the words faster and slower are only defined in relation to these clocks. Now, what if I were to tell you that I can put my pen on this paper and move it up or down, and yet nothing will be drawn? You'd think I'm crazy, right? We'll take a look at this. I just did it, as you can see. I moved my pen, but also the paper. So while the pen was in motion with respect to you, it was not with respect to the paper. Therefore, no picture. Now if I do keep the paper stationary, then I can draw. Voila! I can draw straight lines, fast or slow. I can also draw curves. So all of these motions you see are relative to the paper and you. The curve lines were drawn with an acceleration, their velocity was changing direction. But in the special case where the motions follow a constant velocity, a straight line, we refer to that as special relativity. Einstein, in 1905, published a revolutionary paper about this, and it has changed everything we know about space, time, and even matter. His work is all about how different reference frames moving in constant velocity relate to each other. So let's say you're in your car and you're driving your sister to school. We'll call you guys reference frame A. And your dad is standing by the side of the road watching you off. We'll call him reference frame B for bystander. So he sees you guys driving off at, let's say, 50 miles per hour. But from your perspective, when you and your sister look at each other, you're not moving relative to one another or the car. Now your sister decides to throw a baseball out the front of the car, which moves away from you two at 80 miles per hour. To your dad, however, the ball was already initially moving 50 miles per hour. Plus another 80 miles per hour, it's moving away from him at 130 miles per hour. By this same logic, if the passenger shot a laser beam forward, it should travel away from her and the car at the speed of light, 186,000 miles per second, which is also 670 million miles per hour. And to the bystander, it would be the speed of the car plus 670 million, which yields this larger speed of the laser beam. This all makes sense. Well, there's one problem. Maxwell discovered some relationships between the speed of light, electricity, and magnetism in this equation. But whose speed of light are we supposed to use? Yours when you're driving, or your dad's? So you guys settle on each using your own values for your own cases. But wait, then if you take out your smartphones and try to call each other, it won't work because the electronics on each of your phones are different now since you have different values of C. That's basically saying that the physics when you're moving in a car are different from the physics when you're not in a car. And that's just weird. So which reference frame is the correct one, the dad's or yours? Or even more generally, which one is the right one in the whole world? Scientists decided that there must be one universal fixed reference frame called the ether, in which light travels with its true absolute velocity, c. 
Two scientists, Michelson and Morley, set out to explore this idea. Using mirrors, they split a light beam in two perpendicular directions to measure the relative speeds with respect to Earth's motion and the ether. As an analogy, let's pretend that we shine a laser in two directions, one along the motion of the Earth and one the opposite way. If the light travels at C with respect to the ether, the observed velocity of light going along Earth's direction would be C minus V Earth, because we are traveling along the beam. And the observed velocity in the opposite direction should be C plus V Earth, because we are traveling away from the beam at V Earth. But this does not happen. Light travels at the same speed in both directions. And this disproved the whole idea of having one correct reference frame. Light travels at the same speed in any frame of reference. But how can this make any sense? Imagine now, going back to our example, no matter how fast that car is moving, light is always moving away from it at the same speed. If it goes 50 miles per hour, 100 miles per hour, 1,000 miles per hour, or even 185,000 miles per second. No matter what, light continues to move away from it at 186,000 miles per second. Even more confusing, person B, who is not moving at all, also sees the light moving at that same speed. This is so insane, even sci-fi movies can't come up with this kind of twisted logic. It's just like saying that the speed of the baseball from you and your sister's perspective, and from your dad's point of view, are equal. But then Einstein came along, and he said maybe, just maybe, for those two sides of the equation to be equal, their times must be different. Actually, Einstein proposed that both time and space stretch or shrink to make sure that no matter how fast we move, the speed of light remains the same. Light is like the pacemaker of the universe. Just as your heart beats faster or slower to keep your oxygen levels the same when you're exercising or resting, so too does light regulate the beat of time to keep C constant. Isn't that just incredible? From this idea, it is actually quite easy to derive transformations that tell us how time changes from one reference frame, like your dad's, to another, like you and your sister's. If you want to see the derivations, watch my appendix video. The time in one reference frame A, moving with velocity V relative to another stationary reference frame B, is given by the following equation. Notice that when the velocity is 50, the velocity you and your sibling drove at in our example, V squared divided by C squared is practically zero, and so TA equals TB. This is usually the case in everyday life, where cars and people don't go at a high enough speed for V squared over C squared to become significant. So we don't really notice a difference in time, just like the baseball case. But when V becomes large enough that it's not negligible, the bottom half of the equation becomes smaller than 1, and TA is greater than TB. And if you go at exactly the speed of light, you get zero in the denominator, which equals infinite time. Time stops. And weirdest of all, if v is larger than the speed of light, you get the square root of a negative number, or imaginary time, which no one knows how to explain, yet. So if you still think you're clever enough to come up with a way to break the universe's speed limit, you really gotta use your imagination. And, as I mentioned before, length, or distance, also changes. These two results are called time dilation and length contraction. And they can have some pretty weird implications, like me leaving my little brother to go to outer space for an hour and travel at a really high speed, and coming back to find out he's suddenly way older than me, because my time shrunk relative to his. But hey, here's another idea. What if we were to apply a force to something? Forces make objects accelerate, and their velocity goes up like this. So wouldn't the velocity keep on going up and up until it reaches the speed of light if we exert a force on this object for long enough? What's stopping it from reaching C? Well, what you're looking at is just the tip of the iceberg. Sure, the velocity goes up linearly like this with an acceleration, but it actually starts to taper off. It's asymptotic. Here, there is a literal mathematical limit at the v-value of 186,000 miles per second. So the slope of that curve is decreasing, meaning the acceleration is decreasing. But if the acceleration is decreasing and we're applying a constant force, the mass must be increasing. 
that doesn't mean that the object is literally gaining more particles, it's just becoming harder to push. Now we have a problem. What about the law of conservation of energy? We are applying a force over a large distance, which results in a certain amount of work energy exerted. That work energy we expect to be translated into the kinetic energy of the object. However, as the acceleration slows down, the kinetic energy does not increase proportionally. So, where does that extra energy from the force go, if not to the kinetic energy? It turns out that the energy is actually transformed into mass. Mass and energy are interchangeable, and that's why the mass increases without there being more particles. With these ideas, Einstein derived his famous equation E equals mc squared. Using this equation, we can see that the energy stored in the matter of a small cup of coffee is enough to power a small city for a year. So, if you can find a clean and safe way to convert matter into energy on demand, you will solve all the world's energy problems, climate change problems, world hunger, and probably many of the wars going on today. Thanks for watching!